Just a little bit of background, Dr. Kastner lectures to the public on a wide range of family and child development topics and is frequently interviewed by and cited in the media. She has appeared on the Today Show, the McNeil Literary Report, and many local TV news shows. In addition to being a practicing clinical psychologist, she is also a clinical professor in both the psychology and psychiatry departments at the University of Washington. She has co-authored four books, and those are available on our table. Please welcome Dr. Laura Kassner. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Is it picking up? What do I need to do? Do I need to do something? Oh, maybe turn it on? I didn't know it was off. Ah, thank you, sorry. Just wanted to make sure you aerobically in shape there. Okay, uh, thank you for inviting me back. This is my second time. Uh, I'm pleased to be here. Uh, the other night, uh, when I got here, I went to the grocery store and uh, got my credit card out, and they wanted my ID, and they said, oh, you're from Seattle. And I said, yes, and then he said, well, I'm really sorry for your loss. And I thought, did somebody die, you know? Uh, well, actually, the whole entire city is in mourning, but not that you feel sorry for us. I'm sure there's a little schadenfreude here. We know what happened last year. Uh, but I, am, I have dual, dual citizenship. Uh, so I'm glad to be here. Okay, so this is our topic, and uh, I'm going to actually spread my commentary around. We're talking about launching tonight to college, uh, but as you see, I'm going to jump around so that I hope to address issues that um, pertain to all of you. But as you can see from this slide, uh, this slide, uh, it starts really early. The launch anxiety starts even in preschool. Uh, and this is one of the worst things you can say to anybody. What are your scores, right? Uh, when I talk to uh, students that are launching to college, their worst, worst fantasy is to be with one of your friends who says, uh, what's your dream school, right? And what, how are your SAT scores, right? Or what are your SAT scores is even worse. So one of my, uh, my patients came up with a great retort to a parent that says that, which is, I'll tell you if you tell me how much you weigh. <laughs> so, so, you know, just to, just to let you know how personal that is. Of course, they could say, in, how much is in your 401k or any such personal thing, because it's really, really personal. It's a way of grading people, and it starts very early. And uh, I have seen this happen many times, too. I'm worried about a monster under my bed, and I'm worried about college. This is actually no joke. I mean, actually, uh, I'll be talking about anxiety in many forms tonight, but um, there's sort of, sort of a classic thing that little kids go through where they're afraid of coyotes or sharks or mom dying by, by morning. And it was very interesting. About 10 years ago, I started hearing kids say, I'm worried about college. What if I don't get in college? And you go, where in the world did this 8-year-old or 10-year-old pick up on this? How in the world could it be up in the lake of coyotes and sharks and sort of, you know, mother dies by morning? And what, what has happened, of course, is that it's in the air. That kids pick up, oh, in 2007, you know, the economy's going to hell in a handbasket and uh, you'll never get into college and all those things. And so kids that have anxiety just pick this up as one more anxiety. Here's my last one. This is all of your fears, right? <laughs> We're, again, we're going to talk about your launch anxiety as much as their launch anxiety. Uh, but everybody's worst fear, if things don't go well, that they'll end up on the street. And that's why you probably harangue them to study for their SATs, because who knows what could happen. OK, so focusing on college, one of the things I like to say, it is the tail wagging the dog. And every college counselor I know, and every college admissions officer I know, would agree with me that um, it's very hard for you not to focus on college when you have a sixth grader, ninth grader, uh, sophomore uh, in, in high school and so forth. But really, you know, we should be focusing on now and just helping them become the, the, the healthiest people that they can be. So that's what the, the whole um, concept of wise-minded parenting is. It's the seven essentials that uh, do predict um, uh, best outcomes in young adulthood. So we focus on the whole child, not just those SATs. Um, also, by focusing on college, we make it worse. Whatever we want them to do in terms of doing well in college, uh, having social and emotional, uh, psychosocial health and so forth, by focusing on college, we just get more and more ramped up. And uh, when anxiety goes up, cognition narrows. And whatever you want in terms of cognitive output, it's going to get worse. Have you ever noticed that with yourself? 
right? You're, you might try to do your taxes or you might try to do something really hard on a document or something they're trying to do on the computer. And the more anxious you get, the worse you're going to do. So you need to have this sort of, you know, lowering, lowering your, high, your heart rate and then uh, calming to be able to use your brain. So if we're talking about college all the time, it gets worse. So obviously what we're going to be talking about tonight is what helps. Um, and that's a more whole child approach. Okay. So here, here are the seven essentials. And when I say seven essentials, what I mean by that is each one of these pie pieces that you might try to cultivate in your family has independent predictive power in uh, influencing best outcomes. And when we talk about best outcomes as psychologists, we mean high achievement, psychosocial health, uh, doing well in college, getting good jobs, keeping those jobs, having stable relationships, having stable marriages, having good friendships. Um, I'm not going to talk about anything that doesn't have decades of research and longitudinal research so that uh, causality has actually been uh, established. So um, the most important pie piece in this whole di diagram is your relationship with your child. Okay? Now, I. Yes, it's about love. Love is the engine, you know, that, that makes us motivated to be good parents. But secure attachment is the technical term for the behaviors. Because after all, you know, you can be a, a, abusive and neglecting and imprisoned and all sorts of things and still love your child. But love actually motivates us to be the best parents we can be in terms of behaviors. And the magical behaviors that are part of secure attachment are responsiveness, responsive to their developmental needs, and attunement, we're tuning in to them and being aware of how we're coming off so we know how we're being received, we can adjust things as necessary so that we can keep a positive connection. Okay, so see that academic success? That's a pie piece, obviously uh, academic success is quite important. I mean, that's why I wrote a whole chapter on how to do homework, how to, how to um, set kids up for success. So there's fascinating research in that area. But that little green dot, that's school, that is the college focus. So again, we want to keep perspective so we just don't get anxious and narrow in on one thing. OK. Now, uh, let's go back up for a second and, and, and understand ourselves. Why do we get so pre preoccupied? For one thing, we love our babies, right? And if you remember your childbirth education class, remember how full it was? Weren't most of you in pretty full classes? Because people said, this is a big deal. A baby's coming into my life. I better learn about this, right? Well, in, right now, as some of you are about to transition toward um, launching your kids to college, it's the other end of that. It's as momentous as getting the kid as having the kid go on to the next port. And so what happens is we are very focused on, on wanting the best possible next port for that little launch to go to. And the other thing that happens with that is that we become very vulnerable to marketization of colleges. Right? And again, I'm standing with every college counselor and college admission, admissions person I've ever met. We all agree on this. They might be in the business, but they don't want you to drive your kids crazy or have your kids crazy any more than you do. But it's a very natural thing because we love our babies, we want the best launch, and then even though there are two to 3,000 colleges out there, often we focus on about 20 to 30 of them, as if there aren't uh, thousands, right? One of my favorite little therapeutic moments with, with my patients is to put out uh, uh, the FISC or the Kaplan and say, look at how big these are. We don't even want it digital. We want like this graphic thing. Look at how big these are and just leaf through it. Most of them need 500s on the SATs, but we don't, we don't look at it that way. We just think of, you know, little schools like that one, that red, red, you know, that red bird, that, that one down the Palo Alto where I'm sleeping tonight. We act like that, you know, the brand colleges are the only ones that, that um, have any merit. And what I'm always telling people is that you should rather have your kid at the top of a school like, oh, well, we're in California, at Occidental, than at the bottom of a school like, mm, I'll pick on Princeton tonight. I'm sure there's somebody that went to Princeton. I pick on different schools every night. But as long as I'm in California, I'll pick on Princeton. You should rather have your kid at the top of a school than at the bottom of a school. And yet most of you said, Princeton? I'll take Princeton. Can I get it tomorrow? Sounds good to me. But you really, you know, we all say the same thing. You want your kid to go to the best match for your kid, right, for your student. You want them to match up. But over and over and over, I see these people not get into their name brand school. 
Um, and then they go to other schools, they're perfectly happy. And if they're at the top of a school, then they can get the internships, they can get the letters of recommendation, they try harder because, you know, big fish in a small pond, as opposed to the research that we know when you're a small fish in a big pond, your self-esteem goes down, you sort of look to your left and right, I can't raid around here, and you become a smaller. Now, you know, you can grow into that new challenging place. Most of us have done that our whole life. But it's, it's a very stressful thing to be a small fish in a big pond. So there are many, many silver linings to not going to a name brand, very, very competitive school. Uh, my, I had a really uh, personal experience with this when my goddaughter, who did not consult with me, I might add, only applied to um, top tier schools, the most competitive schools. She got rejected from all of them, except for one. Uh, because she, uh, you know, is sort of her safety school, which should be m most people's, you know, dream school, uh, Colorado College. Some of you know of it, right? Fabulous, fabulous. It's not a booby prize, but she was doing that brand thing where she just, you know, applied to Ivy League schools. So she goes off, she got rejected from 19 colleges. She goes off to, commu to uh, Colorado College. Within a year, she had her EMT. She was the, the practitioner for sewing up the hockey players right on the ice. Then by senior year, she was pre-med, she got her own cadaver. Now that might not be impressive you, to you guys, but if you're pre-med and you can work on one-on-one -on -one with a surgeon for one whole year on your own, you don't do that in med school, right? She got the primo, primo, you know, college education because she wasn't, you know, she didn't go to uh, the most competitive school. So it's just another way of looking at things, that people think that there's automatic, you know, we want a Lexus and, you know, a Subaru might be the best way to, you know, drive to Alaska, right? It depends on you. So I want you to know that this is a marketization thing like anything else and we can fall prey to it. And as I said, the nature of anxiety is that our anxiety goes up, we cognitively narrow, we get very fearful, and then we stop having a broader perspective. Now, to make this dramatic, I'm going to take you back into evolutionary biology and show you that saber-toothed tiger. And uh, you can't see all the little words on there, it doesn't matter, but it's just to give you a little pictorial that, um, when, that when that anxiety goes up, you're flooding. Have you ever heard that word, flooding? What that means is if it, your, your um, heart rate is over 100 beats a minute, um, you are having neuronal activity in your amygdala, the fight or flight reptilian part of the brain, and you don't have access to your thinking brain unfortunately, right? And so that's why sometimes when you get very angry at your child or your spouse or your coworker, you know, you are not at your best. Those are the times where you're screaming or yelling or criticizing or blaming or shaming, doing one of those bad things, and the, those bad things that you'd pay about a million dollars to keep off YouTube, right? What if somebody caught you like that? And we've all been in those situations. And the reason why we get like that is because we were triggered, then we're flooding in our emotional brain, and then we can't access our thinking brain to make the, uh, the best you know, and most uh, productive ways of solving the problem. So when you think about college and losing your hair every now and then, or if your kid is in ninth grade and making an F on a test and you behave in a way that you regret, this is what's happening, okay? So, uh, oh, that's interesting. Let's see if I can get it back. Okay, so um, again, think of that little saber-toothed tiger on the horizon, right? And that's what happens, we, we narrow our vision and then we just tr uh, start thinking about some small piece of the pie. And, that might, and one of the things that happens a lot is uh, anything that's a measure. So IQs, GPAs, SATs, they're all our fault. Psychologists it invented them, right? So blame us, right? Because one of the things that happens is they're concrete. They look all important. They are important, I mean, as if they're not, right? But there are many, many other things, right? Like emotional intelligence and social intelligence. These are meta abilities, big word, but what it means is those things determine how well you can use your IQ long term, right? Most of you here have kids that have absolutely decent IQs, you know, 110, 120, ugh, fine, right? What's gonna take them the distance is all those other uh, seven essentials which is why I wrote a book about hundreds of articles that show those things together are what makes a, a, a positive outcomes. But it's very natural that we narrow because they, these things are concrete and there's a number. There's no number that I know of that measures character. Do you know any number that marries, you know, virtues in action? No, right? Do you know any number that measures emotional intuitiveness? No, 
right? So there are 50, 100 things that we could all say are very important to us. Spiritual strength, uh, you know, empathy, uh, communication skills, but we don't have numbers. So we just go boom, SATs, right? Or boom, you know, a couple of name brand schools. See how innocent we are? We can't help that we get anxious. All these things are happening to us. Um, okay, so I think I've covered those. But um, it's very important for you to know that one of the things, again, because parents are anxious, we love our babies, we flood, adrenaline's released to our, every part of our body and we have this narrowed vision, is that um, the leading predictor for depression, anxiety, and drug abuse is a per perceived academic pressure. Okay, in, in suburban high schools, affluent high schools, the leading predictor, depression, anxiety, drug abuse, is academic pressure. And the leading uh, correlate to that is a distance relationship with parents. So that's why I'm going to talk so much about the parent-child communi communication, the parent-child strength of relationship, because it's so powerful in predicting good things or potentially bad things. Okay. Don't cry, mom. Lots of parents have children who didn't get into their first choice college, and they went on to live happy, fulfilled lives. I've actually seen this, where the, where the child is reassuring the parent, so it can happen. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the relationship, because even though I said, oh, it's the all-important holy grail, it is really hard to keep a positive connection with teenagers, and it's multi-determined, okay? Um, there are many things. First of all, as you know, they're going through their identity formation phase. They're questioning their politi your politics, sexuality values, uh, religious values, uh, educational uh, goals, and so forth. And we've known this since the 40s, the 1940s. Again, decades and decades. You know, uh, when kids grow up and they go through motor development and uh, verbal development and reading development, we're unambivalent as parents. We like that stuff, don't we? And as you continue into developmental psychology, it's like, and what happens during adolescence, right? They've already learned to talk and walk and read and all those other things. They're going through their identity development. But have you noticed we're a lot more ambivalent about that when they question our sacred values? But it's as natural as motor development and verbal development and reading development. It's, it go, you know, they commit, they try on, they, they question the dominant paradigm, as you know, much to your regret, but it is a desirable progression. Those that stay clones to their parents aren't as healthy as those that go through this process, but it can be a tumultuous ro uh, road because some of us uh, uh, get a fit of pique when they stop wanting to go to college or, or what have you, um, excuse me, uh, or it could be college, go, or go to church or, uh, you know, defy your, um, uh, most precious values. Okay, so another thing is obviously hormones. So, uh, most of you, how many mi parents of just middle school do I have here? Do I have any people? They're all high school. Uh, but how many of you still have middle schoolers? Okay, so you know about puberty. You're going through that process with one of your children even as the other one finishes it. Um, but you know the, the strength of hormones. Um, also, the brain remodeling that has happened. How many of you know about what happens to the brain during adolescence? Oh, I have some people that probably want to know about this. This is a huge discovery since the, uh, 1998. That's really recent in, in research land. And what happened in 1998 is it was discovered through brain scan research that there is a, a complete remodeling of the prefrontal cortex, which is the thinking part of the brain. Uh, about 50% of the thinking part of the brain with regard to planning, reasoning, judgment, uh, impulse control, is uh, being pruned away. It's like the jungle of Borneo transitioning to a manicured bonsai. That's what it looks like. This, all, so much of these brain branches just slough off. And many of the brainless activities that you see them do when they you know, don't turn in their homework or they you know, vandalize somebody's house by putting graffiti on it, and you say, what was, what was in your mind to do such a thing? And they say, well, you know, I wasn't really thinking about it, right? So, so much of what's been attributed to raging hormones is really a result also of what goes on in this remodeling. And during adolescence, behavior is often more governed by the emotional part of the brain than the thinking part of the brain, especially during high arousal situations. You know the joke about Saturday night, right? Like for every kid you add to the little social group, the group IQ goes down by 10, 10 points, right? <laughs> 
Isn't that good? I mean, it's a joke, but it really fits, right? When they all get together and say, hey, let's go paint the dumpster, the dumpster at, at Redwood High. And, hey, let's go you know, get some beer and um, you know, ro roll you know, things off the golf course or whatever. And you think, you know that's vandalism. You could be arrested. Maybe they did get arrested, right? Um, how many? Well, we won't have a show of hands, but that's where uh, min minor in possession. You can say it over and over, don't drink as a minor. Uh, but as if that's going to prevent them from doing it, or it, it didn't prevent your doing it, right? We know how many of you drank before your 21st birthday. Many of you. Um, and part of it is the myth of immunity, but part of it is just that when they get together, um, some of their reasoning goes out the window because they're so high, you know, aroused, as I said before. When you're highly aroused and adrenaline is, uh, is coursing through your veins, you can bet that there's going to be compromised thinking reasoning, analysis, and risk assessment, okay? So that's another reason why we get in fights and have acrimony during teenage years. And the other, another reason is just that parents are still the secure base. Do you remember when you had you know, kids in preschool and they get in the, in the car and they just un, completely unhinge? You know, you have a banana and say, I don't want a banana, I want a bagel. I want a bagel, I want a banana, you know, I want fruit juice, whatever. And they just like let it all hang out. Have you noticed it's kind of similar, right? <laughs> Okay, you know, don't say it outside of this room, but we do in psychology call adolescents the second autonomy. The first autonomy is the no, no, no stage of, you know, uh, little toddlers. And the second uh, differentiation is you're not the boss of me during adolescence. Have you noticed? I don't need you. Trust me. I can run my life without you. You're just on a need to know basis. You know, just stay away until I need you, right? Right? Um, and that's very much about the autonomy-seeking um, second decade. And so what happens is they're holding together. I'd love to talk more uh, to you in the Q&A about willpower. There's fascinating research in it about adults and children. But it's a finite supply, and it goes downhill during the day. Have you noticed? Remember the arsenic hour, 5 o'clock? That's when you, know, you want to give it to their kid or give it to your spouse or yourself. It's just we're all kind of... And in the, four, in, the, in the past generations, that's when in the novels they're already, you know, always grabbing about three martinis. We're not supposed to do that anymore, right? Uh, but it's all about we're being very, very tired at the end of the day. And our teenagers come home and they are really exhausted. They've been holding it together all day in eight hours of class and then whatever they do after school and their activities. And they're not supposed to punch the coach or you know, yell at the Spanish teacher and they can't cry when their girlfriend breaks up with them. And they're not supposed to pee in their pants when they you know, get, get scared with their peers uh, making fun of them and sort of hit a bone. They're, they're holding it together all day and then they get with you, the secure base, right? And so they don't have to worry about you. You are going to have their back forever, right? And so they just unwind. And it has a double advantage. They're separating from you. You are also, ooh, when I, trans I had a really putrid yellow that wasn't transferring, and then I punched this reorg on the Prezi, so it didn't transfer perfectly. But that says parents are the enforcers of rules and the um, controllers of resources, okay? Get that? You're the enforcer of rules and the controller of resources, like the iPhone and the, you know, the, the, the car and the gas and the allowance. And that makes you the bad guy, right? So not only are they secure with you, but you gotta do this parenting business called socialization, right? And because you're doing that good job, you're really easy to find irritating, right? So you need to be punished for your sins. Not only that, but you brought a bagel instead of banana or vice versa, right? So they, they've, they're all tired from the day. Day is a hassle. You hassle them with stupid things like chores. Good for you. So of course they're going to let their head out. You know, there's this phrase that they use in dog training, shake it off. You know, when you scold the dog, the dog kind of, you know, shakes off. Have you ever seen a dog do that? They sort of shake it off, the stress. And they're just shaking off their stress on you, right? It's also called dumping on you. Okay, so it's overdetermined. I just gave you five reasons why they are negative with you. And because of that emotionality and because of the brain uh, remodeling, this is my weather map. Most uh, all, I mean virtually about 90% of teenagers are going to have increased moodiness, increased argumentativeness, increased uh, conflict, and more risk taking. Okay, now there are about 10% 
of teenagers that are just won the genetic lottery and have those two long alleles and are very, very optimistic, very, very happy, even during their hormonal, uh, you know, puberty time and so forth. And they just glide right through adolescence. Do any of you have really, really, really pleasant teenagers that never get moody, haven't taken risks? See, nobody wants to admit it. Okay, there's a one or two. And, or three, isn't that nice? I can't, why'd you come? You could go out on a date. <laughs> God, I think he's just curious. He'd be, he's a really good parent. Um, but we're really happy for you, but most of us are in the middle group, and th those people are very lucky, and we just know that they'll do more volunteer work, right? Take their names, take their names, because they they're not having the hard times that the rest of you are. Okay, so you know what I'm trying to do here, right? I'm trying to have build compassion for this group of kids because they're going through this at the same time that they're working really hard, trying to keep up appearances, trying not to cry when their feelings are hurt, and they're working real hard at being teenagers, and therefore you see more of this. Okay, so let's just get a little bit of a survey here about what pushes your buttons. Okay, as parents going through this, what are the top um, peeves that you're going through right now? Ten hands, one. Silence, the silent treatment, right, and that's how the teenager gets privacy, and that's how they screen you out so that they can go through their bubble years. Yes, so close the door, don't come in my room, uh, they might, you know, go to the dinner table, but they're going to give you the silent treatment, especially if they're mad at you because you actually made them do chores, right? Silence, what else? Yes? And now he's, I mean, he's literally not going to high school anymore? He's going, oh, so he's in, I'm going to talk about that. He's in that senioritis, what I called in my book, Winter Blas. He is a classic. We are going to talk about that later. Yeah, that is, and, and, and he's really making you angry, right? He's making me anxious. Yeah, anxious. It's working. Great. You know, you know, the Winter Blas for a senior that's been admitted to college is really a unique state because it's like, I call it the lame duck, right? It's a perfect name because it's like, I am voted into a new office, I don't have to do anything, right? And, we, and the parent does the reasonable thing to say, you know, you have to keep up your grades because they can still uh, recap, yes, yeah, see, see, all the reasonable things and they just enjoy it all the more because he's displacing on you, right? It's like, I am, he's a big primate, he's spoiling the nest, he's ready to go to that next adventure and you are holding him back. In fact, high school is just holding him back. And actually, uh, there are many people in my field that think the senior year should fundamentally change because they just want to uh, basically check out and you know, have it be about um, big projects and a paper at the end, more experiential because they are so checked out. It's a great idea, actually. OK, more, more buttons. I'm enjoying this too much. Yeah. Yes, willfully not doing their homework. I will definitely be talking about that. That's my major feature tonight. Yeah. Okay. Okay. When this mother interviews her daughter, for some reason the daughter doesn't enjoy it. Okay. What else? <laughs> Lack of gratitude. Okay. Okay, now if we did, one more? Breaking curfew. Breaking curfew, okay. Acknowledging. Acknowledging and appreciating, being grateful, yeah. When I'm having a discussion with my daughter and she's on her iPhone. Yes, technology, constantly. Okay, ooh, I could just do this all night. I want to talk about all these things. Yes. Staying up too late. Staying up too late. Too late. Yeah, so some of these are just the rules that we have to impose and then uh, because these are pretty easy things to impose, they're just not going to like it. Yeah. Hollering. Hollering. Oh, I love that word. It's so old fashioned. <laughs> Hollering. Absolutely. Okay, so let me see if, oh, it didn't transfer again. Wow. So something happened when I uh, made this fill out here, and sorry for the transfer. Mr. Sondheim, it didn't work. Okay, so um, we've got this list. We've got this list. Do you think I probably have a good list? Okay, yeah, so all of these things are absolutely normal for adolescents, but boy, they can really push our buttons. Okay, so now that it looks like we disc teenagers, I want to say they are also so amazing to spend time with. 
It really is the, you know, the Dickens line, it's the best of times and it's the worst of times. But the best of times, are, you know, they are so loyal and passionate and fun and funny and creative and imaginative and you have those times too. It's just that sometimes the black clouds of those weather patterns um, uh, overwhelm us. Okay, but I want, that's a shout out for their good stuff. Okay, let's talk about grades a little bit. Um, and we all would know that nagging in lectures don't work. Have you, it's amazing how much we get caught up in what we call reason mind, like logic. You know, in, in life, you'll find if you work hard and you get good grades, you'll go to a different kind of, a kind of college that you will enjoy more. La, 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 you know? And it's like, have you ever seen it work? Okay, very rarely. Um, okay, so we're gonna actually, um, have a wonderful little phrase, a mantra, all the way through wise-minded parent. I have these mantras because if all of us would just recite before we open our mouth, you might be right, but are you effective? It's amazing. We'd probably eliminate 80% of our word count, right? And one way to, to make sure we're staying five to one positive for negative interaction would be for us to hold our tongue, bite our tongue. Is this going to be value added or not, right? That's what we want to be thinking about because so, you know, talking about grades is usually unhelpful. So let's talk about an actual situation. Okay, this is little Sammy, and I don't think this is going to work either, the shadow puzzle. Um, but, that, <laughs> but that father's trying, right? Okay, and here, here's what happens a little later. My parents didn't write it, they just tweaked it. Okay, many of you, I have to admit, this was one of my failings. My daughter finally read one of my books and said, Mom, I think you actually did everything you said that people should do, except for one thing. Uh, because, you know, as an author, I get a paper and I just can't wait to edit and over edit. And thank God I never did track changes, but I know some of you do. Right? And then all they have to do is go, Oh, Mom, track changed? Except, okay, here's the paper. And you wrote half of it, right? Um, this is really a problem now, right? I mean, if, if college admissions people had it their way, they would have no common essay. They would just have a portfolio of work from the high school so that uh, they could have a little more assurance that it was their work, not your work. And uh, so tweaking uh, is ham homework tampering, and that's why teachers like to do in in class essays and so forth, and that's the only way they know it's their work. But it's a little tempting, isn't it? It's being helpful. In the old days, we'd just say awkward and they'd rewrite the paragraph. Now we just pff, rewrite it, right? Um, okay, so we're, uh, we're gonna talk about grit a little later, but um, let's just jump into this uh, situation here. Okay, can we have our skit people? I have Patrick, uh, Sammy, and uh, who's the other one? Oh yeah, yay, Laurie, okay. Come right ahead, and you have, uh, you have the, oh, it's right here. I didn't know if I'd given it to you yet. Okay, so this is going to bring life to the college essay calamity. Want to send mics? Yeah. This is Mom, and this is, this is Sam, and he's supposed to be writing his college essay, okay? Got it. Hi, how's it going? Fine. I'm taking a break. How long of a break? Don't you need a rough draft for dad and your college counselor by Friday? Yeah. Well, your basketball practices and all of the rest of your homework responsibilities this week, didn't we agree that today was going to be the writing day? Um, like I said, I'm taking a break. But Sammy, we are running out of break times. Remember how we agreed that it would be good for you to get a rough draft done last summer? Given your placement problems and the demands of your fall schedule? Mom, I said I'd handle it, and I will. Sam, how am I supposed to lay off when you have renegotiated due dates on this thing three times, and now it's down to the wire? Now I walk in in the 11th hour, and you are doing work heck? Mom, we you cut it out with a crack joke? You're exaggerating again. It's not the 11th hour. The application is not due for another month. Would you chill out? How am I supposed to chill out? You need time for all the edits and all those extra questions on those apps. I settled with this late date for a deadline, and then once again, you're taking a gaming break. And why are we talking about my chill out problems instead of your procrastination? Mom, when are you going to get it? 
this is my essay, not your essay. Why don't you just let it be my responsibility, like the school counselor said at college night. Is that what you want? That sounds really big, Sam, but why don't you just face it? In the end, it lands on me anyway. Honey, what's going to happen to you in college when you don't have a mom to structure you? You'll find out. I can't stand thinking about that. I've been dreading these college apps all summer long. All along. Hell, I've been dreading it since your birth. Don't you know what you're doing me? Mom? You really think this is helpful? <laughs> No, Mom. He's discovering a cure for cancer, working at the homeless center, and tutoring SATs since he has perfect scores. Yay! Thank you. Okay. Anybody identify with that? Just a little? Yeah, we had all. Thank you very much for your excellent performances. And most of us in the biz know that this is pretty classic. And, and you played that so well because you're sympathetic at the beginning, but then as he pushes you away and blows you off, you know, uh, we talked about silent treatment. The other thing is just blowing off, blowing off. Trust me, I'll get to it. And then it just drives you crazy because you know he's wrong, I'm right, you're not getting to it. So it just goes up over time. Okay, so what are mom's hot buttons? I think we've got them all here. Academic slacker, lying, cheating on the internet rules, deception. Uh, laziness, he'll never make it to a good college. Addiction to war crap. Uh, resentment of dad who says, it's just a stage. Um, he's just, you know, polarizing with the Mad Hatter, right? Anger at school who won't make him do it. That's a good one. Uh, humiliation, my sister's kids, Jason, makes straight A's. Self-loathing. Okay, that poor mother. Oh, don't we feel absolute sympathy for her? Have you noticed any similarity, you know, with the this, you know? We really should think about this. How many of our kids are just like this dog going blah, blah, Jason, blah, blah, Patrick, whatever. Um, and that, that's what happens when they blow us off. So there's mom, there's, there's the son. And um, uh, I learned so much from my patients in AA. You know, you know in AA there are these great slogans like easy does it, one day at a time. You've heard some of them. Well, this is a fabulous one. Wait, W-A-I-T. You know what it stands for? Why am I talking? <laughs> Isn't that brilliant? It goes right with the, you know, I might be right, but am I affected, right? And that was what was so great about this skit is the son is saying, uh, and this came directly from, uh, from an actual case, uh, because the kid is saying, is this helpful? Of course it isn't, but we, you know, that mother is just erupting with anxiety, so she says these things, and she should be saying to herself, why am I talking? Okay, so now let's. Do, I want to talk to you about why uh, I wrote another book after Getting to Calm. Yes, Getting to Calm was uh, you know, one of my favorite children. Uh, it has 14 of the biggest hot button issues and how to deal with them. But really, there is a new concept um, that's very cutting edge right now. Um, it doesn't sound like that, but it's wise mindedness. And what it means is that you're combining the best of your emotional skills with the best of your cognitive skills and coming up with effective ways that really do work in your parenting, okay? Now, uh, there, I know this is a mouthful. It's all coming from this uh, new uh, um, discovery. It's called the dialectic of change. And what it has to do with dialectics, as you remember from your philosophy class, is the examination of opposing concepts to understand a principle, okay? So love, hate right, wrong, immoral, moral, honest, dishonest, right? So opposites help us really sort of uh, understand a concept. And we want Sammy to change, right, right? We want Sammy to not game so much. We want him to really dig in in his junior year, uh, or sorry, the fall of his senior year would be Sam. But many of you have kids right now that, as, as we um, just polled, uh, you want them to work harder in school. But here's the deal. Anytime you want somebody to change, especially a loved one, but this could be a coworker, a student, or uh, somebody in your family, you need to start with the bedrock of acceptance. See, two cement eggs on the side of acceptance before you get to change. So a wonderful other mantra that you should use for all situations when your kids are pushing your buttons is, 
I accept my child exactly the way he is, and I want him to do better. But it has to start with acceptance. Think about something that somebody wants you to change, right? You're not going to change it. If they're being obnoxious and ranting and exhorting you to change, you're not as likely to consider, oh, I don't know, cutting back on your drinking, getting you to your taxes by, by April 15th, doing more exercise, going to bed on time, using less technology, whatever it is of your habit. When somebody's really leaning on you, you're going to most likely be quite resistant unless they approach you in a, in a way that works for you, which starts with more acceptance. Doesn't that just make sense? Um, we get very stuck um, in how we're right, and then, and then it doesn't uh, play very well in Peoria. OK, so there are two big uh, mistakes we can make. One is leading with what's called emotion mind, flooding and yelling, or criticizing, or, t uh, or threatening, or whatever. You know, because we just had our button push. And, the, uh, and a wonderful mantra of this, as I said, is your child do, is doing the best he can, and he ne needs to do better. And that goes for you, too. OK, so the second one is leading with emotion, uh, excuse me, reason mind. And that has to do with lectures and arguing about the truth, talking about I'm right, you're wrong. Um, and uh, basically, you could be quite regulated, you could be quite calm, but you're still sort of in the reason mind. So those are the two errors you can make. OK, so um, a better way. So let's go through this, this little um, you know, series of steps and get back to Sammy and his mom. Okay, so the first thing is we have to get our heart right down, right? So one of the acronyms in the Getting to Calm book is C-A-L-M, cool down, assess your options, listen with empathy, and then make a plan. So the first one is we want to get that heart rate down so that you can think better in your problem solving. Now the second one, and here's pure magic is if you are trying to figure out how to approach your child about a, a problem or anybody about a problem, the minute you start deliberating about what's the cost, benefit, risk of maybe talking to Sam this afternoon, or maybe talking with the counselor, or talking with your sister and coming up with a different plan. I don't want this just to be about Sammy. Uh, but any of the problems at home, uh, maybe you think he's drinking too much. Maybe you think he's uh, uh, running with the wrong crowd. Maybe you think he, that he's getting in too deep with you know, some relationship that you don't think is good for him or whatever. Uh, whatever you're approaching, you know, is, you've got to say, now what's the upside and the downside of approaching it this way or that way? And the magic is, if you are evaluating something like that, you are absolutely activating neuronal circuits in your thinking brain, which is a good thing. Right? Because there's a, 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 some of you might know the new book out by Daniel Kahneman. It's called Thinking Fast and Slow. It's a bestseller. He's a Nobel Prize winner. And what, the whole book is about the fact this is fast, this is slow. OK, got it? In a, you know, in a contest, we want those animal brains to win. And it, you know, the, it takes about 100 milliseconds for that emotional mind to be triggered and respond. And it takes three to 10 times longer for it to kind of travel up to our prefrontal cortex and be registered as a conscious thought. So we need to slow down to get into that evaluative mode and figure out what's really value added, what's going to be a constructive approach, OK? Um, don't just do something, stand there, right? <laughs> slow down. You don't want to drive under the influence of alcohol. You don't want to drive under the influence of your uh, emotion brain, OK? Same thing. Your CEO, CEO needs to be engaged. OK, you also want to filter out that being right thing. And then lastly, you want to have a realistic goals. So you know, even if you just, your, your kid just came home uh, under the influence of alcohol last night and you knew you shouldn't talk about it because he's not in no condition, you, you're right. He's underage drinking. He could have really hurt somebody because he was driving. You are right. He is wrong. But how do you want to open up the file? Do you want to open with that, or do you want to maybe approach him a little differently so that you can be more collaborative about it, um, even if you're right? And the most important thing is you, you really can only ultimately control yourself. Uh, even if you're right, even if you have the upper hand, um, the goal should be pretty humble about trying to have him be motivated to change, even if you're in the best um, in the, in the best condition you can be. OK, now, uh, another point right before we get back to uh, Sammy as mom is as follows. Validation is a very, very important skill to have in your intimate relationships. And it doesn't mean agreement, and it doesn't mean approval. It means I get it from some point of view. 
So that's all it means. It means you're trying to be appreciative of some point of view of the other party. Notice how much this can relate to your marriages. Have you been thinking about your marriages? Okay, it's the same thing. I hope you are. Have any of you seen the, uh, the little video, it's two minutes, it's not about the nail? Write that down, two minutes, it's so fun. Later on tonight, uh, watch this thing. It's all about validation. This woman has a nail in her head and her husband's trying to tell her to take it out. It's ridiculous. No, she wants him to feel her you know, pain and what she's talking about. It's, it's so hilarious and it's dramatic and I wish I made it because of course it's viral. But the whole point of it is, we often don't want to be fixed. We want connection. We want people to listen to our feelings. And that's the bridge to anything else that we might want to talk about, like Sammy's uh, schedule for writing his essay. OK, so let's go back to this. And I'm going to um, basically read this so we don't have to have the actors come back. OK, so let's imagine this is what mom did on a very good day, OK? I'm sorry I dumped my worries on you. Sam says, I know you were really, I mean, oh, yeah, worries on you, comma, Sam. I know that you're under a lot of pressure. He says, yeah, so that's why I'm, I'm asking you to chill out. You make everything worse. I realize that you have a ton of demands with basketball, academics, and college apps. It's amazing what you juggle. Yeah, I actually do juggle a lot, Mom. And then I try to relax a little, and you have me under a microscope every second. I can't wait to get to college and breathe for once. Yeah, it'll be great. I'm excited for you. So you master juggler. Uh, what would you propose that we do right now? He goes, well, it's obvious, isn't it? I'm going to go to my room and finish my essay. It's my job to do that and your job to support me. And so she says, lasagna in an hour. Now, I wanted to make this realistic. Notice that even though she's positive, he's dumping on her. He's negative. And once again, you know, you know she's positive, he's negative. And again, she's positive, he goes negative. He's dumping on her. So this is, uh, it looks like a fairly pedestrian interaction, but what's masterful about it and what we're always trying to do is, even though our kids are dumping on us because they're, remember, moody, argumentative, flooding, stressed out, and more likely to risk take, our job is to have a boundary there so that we keep having empathy and we can still think about what's a good way of handling this. So they might toss a negative to us and we can overcome our desire to just, you know, get into one of those sibling fights with them. You're meaner than I am. No, you are. You are. You, are. you know, we're trying to, you know, override that and be more productive. So a good outcome often of an exchange, of really difficult exchanges, aren't that people come out with kumbaya. That's unrealistic. If you read that in a book, don't believe it, right? But it means you're not doing more damage. And the likelihood with this interaction is that Sam is going away feeling better, not worse. Partly because he got to dump, but also because mom has not act added more guilt and more shame and, and so forth. And again, you can apply this to many situations. OK, so these moms do not have borders. This is Mothers Without Borders. You've heard of that group? Um, you need to stay home and study. You'll never get into a good college with those grades. You're so lazy, you'll be going to community college. Um, I just asked this one thing. You're so spoiled. OK, so these people need to, is that, they might be right, but is it effective? OK, so again. OK, now let's jump into some getting right back to college. Say, I'm trying to jump around. Yeah, question before I go. Right. Yeah. Well, that's a very good point because we could, um, you could hear it this far and say, what are you supposed to just be a dumping ground, right? Very good point. Uh, we all have our limits. My daughter, I think it was two years, she'd walk in the kitchen and I call, we called her special ops. She'd just come in like this and I'd say, good morning, Lindley. And she would just kind of go and face plant, do her, do her breakfast thing. Um, and, you know, after a while, I said, oh, this is getting ridiculous. So, you know, at some point, we all target different behaviors, different times. We, we, again, we have to keep that five to one. So sometimes we let the riffraff go. But at some point I said, Lindley, could you just up your game? This is getting a little ridiculous. I mean, it's kind of almost funny. If you could see a video, you'd know it was funny. It's like, how about a good morning? So at some point I targeted that, right? 
Now, you know, uh, a really good thing is to discriminate between thoughts and feelings and behavior, right? If they're in bad moods and they're saying, you don't know anything, or you're too old to be up on stuff, and um, you, you know, you're the meanest mom, you could just say, you know, maybe you're right. There are many times we could just sort of fluff it off our backs, right? Um, but sometimes it gets old, and you can, you can literally say, you know, I've noticed that you're uh, very disrespectful in front of my friends, and, you know, I really want you to uh, have the willpower you show in other settings with me, and I want you to improve that. You can target that. Now, one of the things we have to worry about whenever you're giving me negative feedback, like you need to be nicer to your sibling, is all attention is reinforcing. Remember that? Right? The reason why you knew to ignore the tantrum when they were three is why? If you go, no, no, don't do a tantrum, don't, don't, what happens? More. So if you rag on them about certain things, and again, you're the dumping ground for their hard life, you could easily get more of the behavior that you dislike. So that's, that's the rub here. The other thing is research has found that parents that are a, a little bit tolerant to some of what I call that riffraff, the, feel, the feelings, you don't know anything, and you suck, and whatever, um, the, those kids come out better than the parents. Now, they need to also have strong authority and good attachment. Uh, but when they, it's called emotion coaching, where you're not trying to get rid of all negative emotions. Um, those parents actually, you know, over time have uh, uh, kids that are better in psychological health, more self-control, and so forth. It's very paradoxical, because many of us were brought up with, you can't speak to me that way, right? So it's very paradoxical where, how you get this self-control muscle that, you know, is the whole chapter, uh, uh, second chapter of, my, of the Wise Minded book. But ironically or paradoxically, uh, by not holding them accountable for every negative feeling and trying to get rid of it, they actually end up in, with better self-control later than if you try to control that. Part of that, and this is lots and lots of decades of research on authoritative parenting, that it's the magic threesome of high authority on behaviors, routines, curfews, rules, chores, expectations, compliance, high expectations on that, a very strong, secure attachment is the second big one for authoritative parenting. But the third one is this magic thing called psychological autonomy granting. Well, what is that? That is giving them room for their independent thoughts and feelings. So see, it's a li this is a very mushy thing, because you're thinking, well, wait a minute, I think rudeness is a behavior, and I'm going to hold them accountable. And I said, good luck with that. Um, because uh, if, you, you, if you're going to keep a five to one ratio of po five positive interactions for every one, what are you going to give up, right? So we, we tend to be, just like with toddlers, ignore a lot of the riffraff, catch them when they're good. Thank you for being nice to your younger sister. She thinks you hang the moon. I really appreciate it. I know you find her irritating. Catch him when he's good instead of saying, you need to be nicer, you need to be nicer. You need to, and he'll punch her more every time, right? So we really have to think about all attention is reinforcing. We have to think about um, ignore riffraff so that you can save your negatives for the absolute necessary things like alcohol, sleep, turn off the technology at dinner, all those things. We, uh, you really want compliance with rules. But it, uh, I never want to be mistaken for somebody that sounds permissive. It's just where do you uh, really put your foot down on that authority? OK, we're going to come back to some of those, but let's get to some of this material. OK, I want you to, because uh, I know a lot of you came absolutely uh, to, to get material about college. OK, these are all myths, OK? True or false? Uh, being accepted at the most competitive colleges means you are among the best of the best. Well, this can't, what the heck is best anyway? We already agreed that, you know, just because you have SATs and GR, uh, GPAs and so forth, that doesn't make you a better person because we care about caring people and people high in character. And many kids are slow to mature and late bloomers. Many kids make fair to middling grades and are the most spectacular achievers in our culture. Um, and the thing that they always say to the Harvard middle, uh, for, you know, entering class, and they say it <coughs> at some of the other schools as well, is here you are, the freshman class of, you know, um, Preparation H, otherwise known as Harvard. Okay, here, and you know what? We could fill a whole other auditorium with a second class just as wonderful as you. you this is such a, 
Well, if you can fill a whole second auditorium with another class as wonderful as this, then the ones sitting here aren't the best of the best, right? Just do the math, okay? So there are many ways to sl slice this, but um, this is one of the myths. Excuse me. <coughs> that tickle. Okay, another myth. It does not ensure future occupational success. We'd like to think it does, but there's a lot of variance in the group that goes to highly competitive schools, and some go and flatline, some go and go down, and there are people that are slow to develop that, again, as you know, go to wonderful community colleges, onto other colleges that, and, and community, and did you see Tom Hanks' uh, op-ed last week? It was great. Shabbat, is that the name of that school? Shabot? Yeah, I was dying to know how to pronounce that. I was going to Google it, but I didn't. Um, but if you want to look, Tom Hanks Community College. It's a fabulous essay about, you know, if not for community college, he wouldn't be the man he is. Um, and there are many, many, many people that think that way. It's one of the best inventions in the United States, bar none. Community college, you can make A's, uh, not pay as much money, slip in the back door to public universities, and the world can be yours. So uh, enough of this, you're going to be a failure if you have to go to a community college. OK. <coughs> Tickle time. Oh, I did that thing. OK. So you should go because of superior faculty, peers, and uh, classes and experience. Also not true. I see fail to launch kids all the time because of writing that book. And there's nothing sadder than a guy sitting there like this saying, I don't know why I went to Duke. I went to Duke because everybody said I should, I got in, I should go. He wasn't thinking about was it a good match for him. He was thinking that, you know, because of its name brand, he should go. Um, it's all about the match. Uh, with numbers of applicants, it's, it's a lot harder to get into a good college. Two problems with that, a good college. I hope that you're, I'm bashing the myth that there's such a thing called a good college or a bad college. There are many good colleges, and if you haven't checked out that website, the Education Conservancy uh, uh, Colleges That Change Lives, check it out. Lots of good colleges that you've never heard of. Um, the other uh, operative problematic word there um, is, well, uh, is the, the good college part, but the other part is that it's not a problem of getting into college, it's that most people ap uh, apply uh, about 20 times to different colleges and there are a lot of people bottlenecking that top 20. OK. College admissions officers advise students to focus on preparing a top nop resume throughout high school. Absolutely not true. Every single college counselor says the same thing. Concentrate on becoming the best person you can be, not the tail wagging the dog. It's about focusing on, you know, basically your friendships, your emotional health, your academic quality. Uh, you know, they all say take hard classes that make you work hard, not necessarily just trying to make straight A's. Lastly, uh, no offense to some of you valedictorians, but valedictorians and students with perfect SATs become the top performers after college. They've actually done research on this. Isn't that amazing? People with straight A's in college Again, no offense to those of you that did have those. Um, there, it doesn't necessarily predict what comes after that. It turns out that they're probably perfectionistic, maybe not as creative. They don't take as many risks. They don't invent wild, crazy things like some of the people that you know about. Um, you've got Steve Jobs. You know, we have Bill Gates. You know what they did in college. Um, not that everybody's going to be. Um, that creative, but amazing how we keep talking about every scores going down in America, but we still have more, you know, uh, entrepreneurs and creative uh, designers, uh, probably because of um, some differences in our DNA. We actually have more dopamine receptor 4 in our genetic makeup, and that's thrill-seeking, uh, creative, curious, hard-driving, uh, dopamine-seeking uh, stuff in our DNA. We got in the boats to come over here. We walked over the Be Bering Strait. Uh, isn't that interesting to think of the Americans actually having a slightly different DNA? Um, so it's not just about that linear thing. As a person that made those straight A's, I can say I'm kind of linear. I'm not really a risk taker. I mean, I, I admire people that um, paint outside the box. OK, now in, in psychology, you'll probably, you probably notice that um, 
that uh, there are trends. Like first we are talking about self-esteem, and then we'll be talking about grit, and then we we'll talk about character and the you know issue du jour. Well, I would like to say that the next one is going to be emotional health. If you have emotional health in your teenager, that is a hot commodity. Okay, people that have psychological well-being, they like to be with their friends, they like to go to sleep, they like to. Um, you know, build things. They don't just like to necessarily freak out about school. And some of the freaking out about school has them so scared, I call it the panther in the day pack, so afraid of what's in that day pack, that homework, that they run to other things. And it's not just because they're bad, you know, irresponsible about their homework, it's because um, they've developed so much anxiety about it. So we want to push and leverage uh, some of the resources in our family toward flourishing. Uh, because it's a buffer against uh, mental health problems, um, but also because uh, stress will happen in our lives and we all, we all need to be able to uh, cope with some of that. Okay, this is a little rundown of America today. 60% don't have any of teenagers with uh, mental health problems. 8% have serious disorders and 32% uh, have anxiety or depression or conduct problems, ADHD, things of that sort, um, or substance abuse problems. That's a lot of teenagers with mental health problems. And are we making those things better with how we parent? Or are we making them worse? If the uh, you know, kids are reporting that we're pressuring them academically, again, we might be right that school is important, grades are important, college is important, but are we being received as supportive or as making it worse? Okay, so this is a little old now, not 2010, it's only worse, but basically you can see on the left side uh, that the, um, uh, right there, that the emotional health above average has gone down, and over here you can sort of see the amount of kids reporting that they get overwhelmed, uh, about 20% will say at some point they've even been suicidal. So again, we want to send them off in good shape, not in bad shape. Um, and uh, many of them are reporting school uh, is, oh, the, their home is the source of stress, not support. So one of the things we can do for them is actually supply them with more positive emotions in the home. But we're stressed out too, right? We've got the 24-7 marketplace, we've got email to do when we get home. We're stressed out, our you know, self-control is diminished. Well, are we making it better or worse? What kind of fishbowl do they come home to? One that makes them happier or sadder, right? Um, and, you know, one person's uh, feast is another person's famine. Some people will hike, some people will watch sports, some people will do puzzles, but we need to have some kind of playtime so that we can all uh, manage our stress bit better. Um, whatever we do to infuse that environment with positive emotions uh, can make it better. This is me. When moms dance, the kid says, ah, you know, you're hurting me. My, this actually happened to me. I was dancing around the kitchen once just trying to put a little good mood. So it sometimes, you know, flops when you're trying to put a good mood in there. Uh, flop for me. My son thought I was pretty crazy too. Um, okay, so strong character is uh, another a whole chapter on this. I think it's really important. And... Uh, this is a problem when a kid says, why do I have to be talented at something? Why can't I just be talented, right? As if, right? So here's my little shout out for after school activities. I know it's really a fad lately to talk about the overscheduled child. And obviously as a psychologist, I see that group that can be overscheduled. Um, but actually 50% of American teenagers have no activities out of school and only 6% have over 20 hours, and of that 6%, many of them are thriving. So again, there are some clinical cases, they show up in my office, it's not like I'm gonna say it doesn't exist, but I would like to promote after school activities uh, because of the following reasons. First, we know that they do build character. There's wonderful research on this, it does, it does sort of promote values in action. Um, we know it's linked to positive mental health. Um, they're around positive peers. They're also around adults. One of the problems in America is that we've sort of relinquished peers, kids to peers, not that peers aren't wonderful and social support from friends isn't wonderful, but um, kids need to be around other adults, alternative heroes, people that they might be more comfortable talking about uh, stressors with than us because they're, they're separating from us. 
Um, so you get a lot of bang for your buck. And of course, as you know, when does most teenage pregnancy occur? You know, drug abuse occur, vandalism occur. Well, you know, 3.30 to 6.30 in the afternoon. So it's a good place for them to be with those immature brains and, and sort of poor risk assessment. Sometimes it's good to have kids in activities where they're safe. We want you to have fun as long as it's fun that enhances a college ad admission application. <laughs> well, that's kind of cynical, isn't it? Right? I hope none of you ever say that. Don't, first of all, it doesn't motivate kids to do whatever you want them to do when you say, you know what, you've got a lot of free time, I want you to work in the no nursing home. My friend runs one, here's a card, be there tomorrow, right? You don't want to say something like, uh, do that because it looks good on the resume. You want to say, in, in uh, adolescence, sometimes it's really easy just to focus on your own happiness and your own achievement, and it's also important to us that you care about others. From those who have more, have more, more is expected, all that good stuff. Um, we don't need to make it be about the college application. It's about building good people. Okay. So physical health, I cheated on my last chapter. I said it's about seven, you know, seven essentials of uh, raising uh, successful teens. But in my, in my seventh chapter, I put in 10 more things. Okay, so we had a couple uh, questions about sleep. Sleep is really important, right? How, how, much does the, how many hours does the Na National uh, Sleep uh, Foundation recommend that uh, high school teenagers get? Yeah, nine and a half, right. What is the average that the high school senior gets? Six and a half. And this goes, oh, well, you know, what can you do? We like them to make A's. They need to do their homework. Well, it's a really big deal. The research is, I mean, there's more and more and more research. Right now, going forward, dude, this is going to be a really hot area because we know it helps with memory and learning, better driving. I mean, when they make one of those late start things, uh, the, the, the stats show uh, fewer uh, accidents in the morning, better cognition when they go to school, when they, when they take tests. Uh, sleep is really important. Um, but uh, we need to talk about stress management uh, too. We can talk about nutrition, we can talk about nature, any of those things in the, uh, in the uh, list of 10. I'm going to leave that for Q&A. But I want to talk about stress management, back to that anxiety piece. Okay, most of us are gonna go home to something that looks like this, tasks that we need to do, messy kitchen, and maybe 194 emails that we have to respond to. I'm so sorry. I'm so glad you're with me. Um, but you know, it's lucky if we are having family dinners, but many people's family dinners look like this. Um, and uh, we need to fix this, but uh, we need to, you know, well, let me tell you about most teenagers are having about you know, 7.5 hours of screen time a day or you know, electronic connection. And because they're on multiple gadgets, it's about 11 and a half. OK, so this is what we need. It keeps me from looking at my phone every two seconds. <laughs> we need. Right. OK, now this is a very, very important concept because this is called a default setting. If you put a, something on yourself so you can't look at your phone and you're trying to like diminish that, that eye contact of the phone, this keeps you from doing the wrong thing, okay? So like your thermostat at home, right? When you set it to go down to 60 or something during the day, it's controlling something so that you have good behavior, right? So the prediction of my future with technology is we are very vulnerable, if not weak, to the power of technology, right? We're weak because the dopamine that's released when we're gaming or we're shopping or we're doing ESPN or we're texting or we're looking at our email to get it done and double task is very, very powerful, okay? As, as the neuroscientists say, in a contest, the emotion mind wins, okay? It's more powerful than this, right? Fear is the most powerful. Right? So if there was a bunch of you know, jihad people coming in, we'd be instantaneously out of here. Right? And if some of you, you know, had access to the, your favorite thing on a gadget right now, you know, your shopping channel or, your, uh, or something else, you'd want to look at that. So because these systems are so powerful, uh, the dopamine uh, pathway is what it's called. That's the neurochemical that's released in anticipation of the goodie that you want. Right? Because it's so powerful, we need those cones like that. 
probably what's going to happen is we're going to walk into our, our houses pretty soon um, and there's going to be that Nest you know, computer and they're going to protect us from doing the wrong thing. So they'll turn it off when dinner happens, they can turn it off when it's time to go to bed and we'll have it set just like a thermostat so that we do the right thing. Because in the moment we may not choose to, okay? So in the meantime we need to have rules and systems. Okay, to go back to college for a minute, back to stress management, I want you to understand that your, your high school seniors are going to be going through a lot of this in, in, the next, uh, uh, in the next few months. The minute they get accepted and they're happy, they're going to start worrying, do they like their roommate, you know, will, they might have you know, uh, chosen something else and been happy. Uh, they're going to feel like they're an imposter because they're a small fish going to a big pond. Uh, a lot of worries happen. A lot of, of voices from within and without. So empathy to them. Now empathy to us. Okay, so we already talked a little bit about senioritis. Um, this is what it looks like. Okay, anybody got one of these at home? Yeah, 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 she does, we know. Empathy to you, right? Uh, power surges refer to that sometimes that because, do you remember that song? I think it was the Three Dog Night. It's dating me, but we gotta get out of this place if it's the last thing we ever did. Remember that? So they're all singing that in our head. I gotta get out of this place. They are, you know, big primates in a nest that they want to leave. leave. And uh, a lot of uh, partying will happen, a lot of risk taking, a lot of spoiling the nest. You know, they used to put their dishes away. They used to take their library books back. They used to do all sorts of stuff and all of a sudden they're going to say, hey, you know, um, you're not the boss of me. Uh, so one theory that I have, especially if you are really nice parents and you have really nice kids, Sometimes they create more friction so they can kind of get it, the friction going so that they're, you know, they make more trouble, you're more of a pain in the neck, they're less ambivalent about going to college. Isn't that a perfect solution? So you really need to think about this because you might go, oh my gosh, we only have three months left and we're fighting more. And you, you might want to say, maybe this is nature's way. We're fighting more so he's less ambivalent about going to college. I know that sounds a little shrinky dinky, but we see this. This is a syndrome we see. It might mean because you're really nice, they have to make trouble so it's easier to leave. Okay. And of course, it could be related to that surround sound I just did that, that they are um, going through a lot of growth pangs related to a lot of things. They're anxious and it, and it just has to do with that shake it off thing. Okay. So, of course, what we all would recommend is batten down the hatches, you know, rules shouldn't go out the window, uh, but it could uh, be one of the hardest years. Many people, the reason why I wrote a whole book just on the last year of high school is that many people say it's the hardest year of, of child rearing. Not everybody, uh, but some people say it's the hardest because of all that friction that happens because they're ready to go. Okay, so back on that stress management, I, the, you don't need to read all this, but basically all the red is showing about uh, arousal in that adrenaline system, stress cortisol. It affects every organ of your body, okay? And now that we don't sleep enough, we're in commuting traffic, we do work at home, we have more stress as Americans than ever. And that's why sometimes, even though they say, you know, that we have the best healthcare system in the world, we don't have the best rates in mortality, morbidity a lot of times because we are so stressed. So the, the blue side is the, is the mindful response. Anything that gets that heart rate down, right? Now, yes, exercise is good. Yes, yoga is good. But one reason why you're hearing so much about mindfulness these days is that meditating, prayer, anything that calms you, uh, really is going to help you not only get to your wise-mindedness with regard to, you know, dealing with your children, but it's also going to help your health and help your children's health. So probably another, here's my forecast. I told you sleep's really important. Uh, shutting off technology is really important. Another big thing that's going to be happening is everybody's going to learn about um, techniques to get that heart rate down and free your mind of worries so that you don't have the damage to your system of that uh, false alarm, you know, getting ready for battle. Get, you know, your, your body, as it evolved over a hundred million years, was only supposed to go on sprints every now and then when a tiger was after you. It's not supposed to be all day long because you're on the highway. And that's really bad for your system, but our systems were evolved for another time, not the last, uh, not 200 years, right? Okay. 
So I'm going to end with this so we have lots of time for question. But I want to uh, say, you know, this is really a hackneyed cliche, I know. You know, that first you have to give your oxygen to yourself before you can give it to your child. Remember when you first saw that on the airplane and you thought, that's weird? Of course I want to save my baby first. And you go, oh, I get it. That's right. If I pass out, I can't be any good for the baby, right? So it's the same thing with our children, is that if we don't take care of ourselves, we can't take care of them. If we don't sort of have stress management uh, approaches and get that big angled view on, on how to be healthy, how do we go home and not only override those aggressions toward us, but you know, create that fishbowl so that there's infused positive emotions that those kids experience with us when they get home. Uh, and some of us are unsung heroes. I think parents of adolescents are unsung heroes. I mean, it is hard, hard work. All that overriding, negatives that come at us, um, all the challenges, we care about them, we've got so many responsibilities. Um, and so, yes, the, the worst of times, but the best of times as well. And this is the end, yeah, we want those graduation moments. Okay, so that's gonna be that, the end of my formal talk, and I, I, I'm very grateful for the gift of time that you gave me and that what this represents in your caring about your, your uh, teenagers. So on that note, I'll stop and move to questions, okay? I'll move. okay. Thank you. Okay, I had a lot of hands. Yes? Um, I don't think this was necessarily intentional, but um, the question would be gender differences between the parents, uh, between the mother and the father as they relate to their teenagers. Yeah, yeah. Um, in your skits and in the cartoons, many of them, it was a stereotypical image of the mom with yeah. the kids and kind of ragging on the kids. Yeah. Um, can you talk about collaboration between yeah. fathers and mothers at home and yeah. how their style is different. Yeah, okay, so he asked about um, gender differences, and you're right, I had mom up there, but um, you know, I did dad last night, and sometimes I do only dads. I was actually gonna do a dad tonight, but I did a mom. Um, gender differences. Okay, now the interesting thing about gender differences, and there is just a huge study out, another study, showing, well, it was based on 20 million subjects. It's a meta-analysis of 40,000 studies on gender differences. Can you believe that? And the thing to say about that is there are much more within group differences of females than be and males, right? There are more differences in the big normal curve between them than between the genders. Uh, in, in all domains of cognitive, emotional, personality, um, and so forth, behavior. Now there, there are some. Uh, and it will be emotional expression, and uh, uh, you know, women have more emotional expressiveness, men have more aggressiveness, uh, but again, the, t the differences are very small. The biggest difference between parents would be temperament, okay? Temperament in your children, temperament in yourselves will be a much bigger predictor of how that parent-child works. So if you tend to be high, strong, and reactive, and a strong personality, uh, you're probably going to get into it more with your child. If you tend to be quieter and more introverted, and you have a low threshold for getting aroused, then you're probably going to have less conflict. So, okay, so it's much more of a temperament difference than, than a gender difference. Now, I wrote in Getting to Come, I wrote a whole chapter on when mom and dad disagree. And I really appreciate your question because. Anytime you have anxiety in two people, again, it could be parents, it could be a coworker, it could be in, within your own family of origin. When there's a lot of difficulty between two people, it drives them apart. Polarize is a verb, right? So what happens is you could start out pretty similar about something like um, uh, curfew or alcohol rules or uh, expectations for grades. You could start out pretty similar, but if one person's really getting into the getting in with the getting into it with the teen in high conflict, this other one will naturally soft shoe it. You know, if he's hardlining, she'll soft shoe it. If she's hardlining, he will he will start to to try to pacify things, and it creates huge problems, and it's absolutely natural in human interactions that if one person's fiery, the other person wants to, wants to pacify. 
It's fascinating because I work at Children's Hospital in Seattle, and you know we see all sorts of disasters. You know, kids that are going to die from a gunshot wound or you know from a fatal disease, and you you almost never. I can't even think of one time I saw both parents lose it at the same time. Think about your marriage. One person's losing it, you naturally sort of solidify as the other one. It's just a, a natural thing. But unfortunately, this syst we call it a system response. This polarization drives people apart right when they need to pull together. And the interesting thing about that small difference, let's say it's about curfews or it's about great expectations or, or alcohol expectations, is that it'd be much better to just split it in half, whatever it is, and call it good then spend time saying, no, it needs to be my way, my way, my way. Because sometimes the anxiety is so great, we just want to win on that policy. And, we, and as a psychologist, I can tell you, you want unity so much more than you want to get your way. Because that you know, kids will find a space in that, in that divisiveness and drive a Mack truck right through it. Right? Whether it's about grades or, or anything else. So, um, you know, it takes calming down. It takes a lot of time to say, let's come to the middle with some policy we can both live with and let's be lockstep, right? The magic thing is to be calm, confident, and unified. Because if you're confident as a parent, like saying, yes, I know you're a senior. Uh, one of the other little skits I do is, hey, I'm 18, I'm about to be in college, why don't you loosen up now, right? Um, I know how to handle my liquor, right? So one of the typical things is, no, I don't want to let up. You know, it's illegal. You know, if I find that you're under the influence, there will be a consequence, right? Um, it doesn't mean you're controlling every minute and they're not drinking, but they need to obviously have it really together if they're going to be home on time, not under the influence. And if you wonder, then you get to breathalyze them. If you wonder, you get to... Uh, you know, uh, uh, give them a drug test, right? Uh, you can do that if you want. You're not going to follow them around every minute. And, and if they're really responsible and they're sober, you, you don't want to be that, that extreme about your interventions, right? But basically, you know, that, that one thing, should we let up the senior year, can divide couples apart? Or should we make them do SAT ca uh, uh, counsel uh, not counseling, but um, tutoring or not? Uh, it's really hard to get two parents calm and uh, together and just, and just come to a unified place, but it's really worth the time. It's worth maybe even a consultation because it can be uh, so much of where the parenting goes downhill after that. So thank you so much for that question. Yeah, next one. Yes? Mm -hmm. uh, other parents, other adults, yes, this, yes. Okay. And so a lot of the kids have huge anxiety. Yes. Uh, other kids yes. Okay, that's a wonderful question. Her question was that anxiety, now you know why I had that thing about uh, I'm scared of monsters under my bed and I'm scared about college, because it can start really young. It really is in the air. Her question was, what can you do when it's coming from peers, it's coming from parents, it's coming from the school environment? Uh, you know, you could say the same thing for the attraction to technology. You could say the same thing for alcohol and drugs, right? Um, all you can do is try to be the best parent you can be and be known as not that parent. So one of the things that ha you know, when I first read that study by um, uh, Cynthia Luther, I said, oh, really? Academic pressure is number one? And then I started listening to my patients, and they said, all my parents talk about is school. They'll say, or you have a, a custom that obviously there's going to be a chunk of time that's, that's homework in the, is it working? I think, ah. it's coming in and out. Okay, uh, then, you know, the routines should do some of the heavy lifting for you so you don't have to talk about it all the time. And again, we could do the why am I talking and the, you know, is this, is, you know, I might be right in that this is important, but is it effective? And if I'm getting known as just anxious about school, is that helping? So one thing you to do is, is discipline yourself to say, hey, 
you know, when are you going to have some fun this week? And hey, you know, like when will be our, you know, when can we do that, um, that game we like so much? Or, you know, when can we go and uh, take a bike ride? Or whatever it is. Be known as somebody that wants to be about the mental health in, the, in, in their lives as opposed to just the person that's monitoring school. Half the time they're doing that blah, blah, ginger thing anyway. They don't even hear you say, when are you going to do your homework? You know, when are you going to do this? They're just like, you know, this you know, swatting a bad mosquito or something. So I guess one question would be, you can be different. You can't control the environment or their peers, but you can certainly be known to be different yourself. And that will give you huge credibility with your child, huge. To say you're concerned, to say you want to make sure that um, uh, you pull the technology and even homework at a certain time at night to make sure they can just read for pleasure. That's, I mean, they can go, pull, you know, have, try to go to sleep, and some can't go to sleep because they're so anxious. So sleep hygiene, that's the word we use for good sleep habits. Sleep hygiene is a whole other area. It's like people will say, my kid can't sleep. Well, because they still got all that adrenaline, you know, jangling them up, right? If you worry when you put your head on the pillow, you can't get to sleep, right? Another re reason to learn mindfulness and learn meditation. Uh, but another thing, in the olden days, people had less trouble because what they do is they turn off the TV, they do their little ablutions or whatever, and then they pull out the book. The big joke is people, oh, I love to read, but I fall asleep every time I pull out the book. That's what you're supposed to do, right? <laughs> Right? So you remember Pavlov's dog. That's called classical conditioning, that the experimenter comes out with the little, food, uh, the little piece of meat. And every time uh, that the, um, the chimp saw the experimenter, he started to salivate. Or was it a dog? Right? It was a dog. Pavlov's dogs, of course. Um, I, I've got so much chimp research. OK, so that's, that's what's supposed to happen with the book. Every day, they do their homework. They take themselves off the screen. They then. Uh, do whatever to get themselves ready for bed and then they you or they pull out a book and then you get drowsy drowsy because if you do that every night the book in your brain is connected it's the white coat sleep right so that's the beauty of having uh, pleasure uh, pleasurable reading and having good habits and pulling technology so that your kids actually read for pleasure if it's the only thing going around They'll pick to read. If they, if, if they have an option, they'll probably do a gadget, right? So anyway, sleep hygiene is impor a very important part of decreasing stress as well. And, and the bed can be actually a stressful place because they worry. So we've got to fix that to help their anxiety level too. And, and in terms of lobbying your, your, your parent group or your school for less stress, do whatever you can. You know, get a mindfulness class in your school and, you, and you'll be doing much better. Yes? Oh, listen, it is, you know, you all in California, around here, you're in the north of San Francisco. I just figured that out. So there's a mindful school um, movement going on. Look it up, mindful schools. I encourage you all to lobby your school for a mindfulness course. Um, you know, mindfulness-based stress reduction is an eight-week class. It was invented about 35 years ago by Cabot Zinn. It's a class. It's not therapy. You learn to relax your brain. And your brain is, uh, you know, uh, this ability to relax your brain is like a muscle, like running three miles every day. Practice, practice, practice. Then you have physical fitness by running every day. If you practice, practice, practice these mindfulness uh, uh, guided meditations or whatever, then you start to even move into this progressive relaxation and you get relaxed. So when you wake up in the middle of the night at 2 o'clock, you might go, oh no, oh no, I'm awake. You go, okay, I'm just going to practice my meditation. Because you've done it 30 times, the brain is expecting to go into this nice little trend and you can relax and go to sleep. You can tell I'm a really big promoter of mindfulness because I know the right research. I just did a grand rounds at our hosp hospital. There are hundreds of studies proving uh, the benefits of learning how to relax your mind. It's okay, it's not, it's not, it doesn't have to be, you know, uh, fancy stuff. So, okay, now it is, is this supposed to be over at 8 30? Okay, I'm supposed to run in that direction. I'll take, should I just end it right here because I'm tardy? Thank you for your attention and I will move over there. Thank you.